Hello, everybody. First of all, congratulations to you. You have made it to near the end of Davos. I'm impressed with your health and well-being. Obviously, you're in a great place to learn more about health and well-being today. Um, it's delightful to see you. My name is Mariette Di Cristina. I'm the editor-in-chief of Scientific American. And I have a, a wonderful, distinguished panel here to talk about the topic of let food be thy medicine. Before we begin that, I want to mention a couple of quick housekeeping things. Obviously, as soon as I can, I'm going to turn to the audience for questions. I see we have uh, quite, a, quite a number of people here, and I'm sure you all have lots of questions. Um, there is a translator next to you, Juan Roca next to me, who will be uh, speaking in Spanish. So please set it to a one for English and two for Spanish, if you need that. Um, and uh, as always, please turn off your phones. Please turn off the ringers if you can. And later, when we come to questions, I'm going to be asking you to identify yourself and, and before you ask the question, please, just to help the audience. Before I get underway, just out of curiosity, is anyone here a nutrition researcher? Just out of curiosity. Ah, OK, interesting. <laughs> yes? <laughs> right. Other than the distinguished panel. So the question today is, um, how can our daily diet and our dietary habits improve our health? And because our panelists all come from sort of different perspectives, I've asked them to each introduce themselves with, um, with a minute or two of areas that they're particularly keen on. And uh, David Agus, could we start with you, please? Sure. So I am David Agus. I'm a professor of medicine and engineering at the University of Southern California. Um, I am a cancer <clears throat> doctor by trade. So two to three days a week, I look at someone in the eye, and I say, I have no more drugs to treat your cancer. And I don't want to do that anymore. And so I believe in prevention. I push on prevention. And when you talk about nutrition, unfortunately, in most people in the United States and Europe, as soon as you start to talk about health and nutrition, people's eyes glaze over. And the reason is, is there's a lot of noise. Right? You hear one day something is good for you, the next day it's bad for you. You hear this diet is great, this diet is bad, and it changes all the time. So most people turn off. And so we had a session yesterday at the health governors where we were talking about how to educate people about nutrition. And you know, the first question I ask is, how do you know what nutrition is? How do I know what health is? We don't have a definition of health. So I think it's very key whenever we talk about nutrition that we say, is there data for long-term outcomes? Outcomes are not changing a number. Outcomes are not making some aspect get better except preventing disease or living longer. Those are the two things that obviously we care about when we talk about these <clears throat> topics. So in the United States, we spend more on uh, 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 vitamins and supplements than we do in all of the medical research. Yet there is no data that any of them have shown a benefit in the average individual. And in fact, in many of the studies, they've caused harm. When you take vitamin E for over three years in a $250 million study, it increased prostate cancer by 16%. It was actually meant to prevent it, and it increased it. Women who take high-dose vitamin D have increased bone fractures, not decreased. And so you can go on and on through these. And so I just want to say, let's look at the data, and let's really start to define things and say, are there long-term outcomes here? Because that's where we need to act. Thank you. Hi, I'm Simin Maidani. I'm a professor of nutrition and immunology and director of Nutrition Center on Aging at Tufts University. My passion is to find um, nutrition interventions and uh, other lifestyle factors that can change the trajectory of older people from one that is burdened by diseases to one that is healthy, active, and successful. And um, I think there is a lot that we can do. Uh, it's only about 25% of our risk for diseases can be uh, really explained by genetics. So there's a lot that we can do with nutrition and other lifestyle changes to impact how we age and be successful. And um, we use different types of um, methodology to ask that, ask that question, whether it is to animal studies or to human trials. And exactly what, what David was saying, that we really need to have uh, clinical trials with uh, definite outcomes that would um, answer questions that we're interested in. Thank you. Hi, Mary. I'm Dean Ornish. I'm a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. 
and the founder and president of the nonprofit Preventive Medicine Research Institute. I'm a big believer in research uh, as they are. And for the last 37 years, I've directed a series of studies that have shown how powerful changes in diet and lifestyle can be. You know, we tend to think of advances in medicine as being a new drug, a new laser, something really high-tech and expensive. And we're using these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures, as, as David is doing in his work, to prove the power of these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions. We're able to show for the first time that even severe heart disease could actually be reversed. There's an emerging field called lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle is treatment to reverse conditions, not simply to help prevent them. We showed that we could reverse heart disease using a comprehensive intervention of a whole foods plant-based diet that's also low in refined carbs, uh, moderate exercise, walking a half an hour a day, various stress management techniques, including yoga and meditation, and perhaps most important, love and support, which we don't tend to talk about as being too touchy-feely and yet I think are central for reasons we can get into if you're interested. In our more recent studies, we showed that these same lifestyle changes that can reverse heart disease may slow, stop, or reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer, can reverse type 2 diabetes better than drugs can, and can change gene expression in over 500 genes, turning on the good genes that protect us, turning off the bad genes, particularly what are called the RAS oncogenes that promote prostate, breast, and colon cancer. And most recently, we published a study about a year ago with Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize in Medicine five years ago for discovering telomerase, the enzyme that repairs our telomeres, which, as you know, are the ends of our chromosomes that control aging. And as your telomeres get shorter, our lives get shorter, and the risk of premature death for pretty much everything goes up. We found that we could actually lengthen telomeres by simply making these lifestyle changes. And so even though um, we tend to think of drugs and surgery as being the primary interventions, we're now realizing that lifestyle can play a powerful role, not only to prevent, but also to treat disease. Thank you. Uh, for people who are interested in learning more about Dr. Blackburn's research, by the way, I interviewed her for Davos last year, and that's on TopLink. Joan Roca. You come from uh, a different perspective all, uh, than the others. Uh, could you speak about your areas that you're working on? Well, yes, my name is Joan Roca. I have a restaurant in Girona in Spain. What we do is uh, known as haute cuisine, uh, but I think what's essential is uh, that there's a dialogue between uh, chefs and scientists. Now, that's a dialogue that exists. Uh, there is a dialogue between, if you like, the kitchen and the laboratory. And that's good, but now we face another challenge, which is to use the high profile that chefs have today, and that's something which is relatively new in our societies. But I think we can tap that high profile to really aid our cause. It means we have a responsibility as chefs to use our know-how to get messages across, messages that can be useful for society and how society eats. It's very important that we use scientific knowledge to be able to explain things clearly in a way that really can be heard by consumers because consumers need to know what habits they should develop, what, above all, they should eat, and where their food is coming from. And even, as I should also say, we should really get into people's very uh, mindsets, their very attitudes, uh, an ecological understanding, namely uh, understanding not only how what they are eating affects their health, but how it can affect and benefit the planet if, uh, if we take an ecological awareness to what we eat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, those are very interesting thoughts, and I'd like to come right back to that in, in a minute, please, uh, because I, I want to connect it up. So for the people who are working in research, because I, I think you've raised an interesting point, and we've talked a lot at Davos about uh, cross-disciplinary discussions, and I think that this is one of the great places to do that sort of thing. But just to begin to um, approach that, could, could we talk just an, another minute? You, you all mentioned, uh, the three of you, several studies 
different studies of things that were observations about uh, people, people taking, uh, eating certain things and their outcomes not being as good as expected or better than expected or uh, supporting uh, more graceful aging or healthier aging. Could we speak just for another minute or two about uh, what we know about nu nutrition's effects in the body and how do we know that uh, from the standpoint of science? You've mentioned some observational studies. Can we see what's going on? No, I mean, there's no way. So we are a complex emergent system. And the notion of correcting a number, fixing one thing, really takes the eye off the ball. And I think we do that over and over again in medicine. Remember, 35 years ago, we told people, eat margarine, not butter. Yes. And what did we do? We accelerated heart disease. For the last 10 years, we told people, listen, you got to watch your sugars, because sugar's bad. So don't eat these sugar substitutes. They're perfect food, right? They stimulate your sweet tooth, yet you don't absorb them, so they can't harm you in no calories. And an amazing study came out in Nature a few weeks ago where they first gave mice these sugar substitutes, and after two weeks, they all got diabetes. Then they gave these mites antibiotics first, and then the sugar substitutes, and no diabetes. And the mice with diabetes, they took their bacteria from the GI tract, gave it to another mouse, it got diabetes. So while we didn't, and they showed the same thing, by the way, in, in young men. So while we didn't absorb these, it changed our system to push us to diabetes. So anyone who tells you there's a superfood or eat this to do this, you really got to question and take a step back because there's no simple way. We don't understand yet this complex emergent system. This microbiome, and you have tenfold more bacteria than cells in the body, we're just starting to even scratch its surface. So it's a whole new dimension. And I guarantee you over the next decade or more, there are going to be more dimensions coming out. So, but the good news is you don't have to understand a complex emergent system to control it. You know, the climate modeler doesn't go up every day 10,000 feet and measure the wind speed and the temperature. They look at the shape of the clouds and it tells them what's going on. So we need to figure out more of those. And I want doctors like us to be much more like climate modelers yeah. than biologists in many respects going forward. Can I uh, sure. add to that? Um, while I think we always need more studies, I, I, I take a slightly different point of view that we do know a lot. And we do know what I think for most people an optimal way of eating and living is. And um, in all of our studies, we use the same intervention. It was a whole foods plant-based diet that was naturally low both in fat and in refined carbs, uh, moderate exercise, stress management techniques, and love and support. And we found in all of our studies, and it wasn't like there was one set of dietary recommendations for reversing heart disease, a different one for diabetes or prostate or gene expression or telomeres. It was the same intervention for each of these. And the more people changed, the more they improved. There's this reductionistic tendency in science to try to want to like parse out, you know, what is this particular constituent? You know, the, you know, I debated Dr. Atkins many times before he died, and you know, he got pegged as the low carb guy, and I was the low fat guy. And my work has never been just about any one thing, mm -hmm. and it's and it's not even just carbs versus fat. There, there are new studies coming out showing that animal protein itself may be harmful. There was a study that came out. Uh, by Levine in uh, cell metabolism last March, showing that people who had a lot of animal protein had a 75% higher risk of premature death from all causes, a 400% increased risk from uh, all forms of cancer, and a 500% increased risk of type 2 diabetes, independent of the fat and, and the cholesterol. And also, I've you know, been in, 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 in these debates with Dr. Atkins or people who followed him, um, or there have been studies done comparing a so-called Ornish diet versus a, an Atkins or equivalent or paleo or these kinds of diets. And they'll say, well, you know, the cholesterol levels weren't that different and the weight loss wasn't that different, so kind of eat what you like because it doesn't really matter. But if you actually look at what happens in the arteries, it matters a lot. Mm -hmm. And there was a review article by Stephen Smith in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago where they actually showed that on a whole foods plant-based diet, like I'd recommend, the arteries are essentially clean. On a typical standard American or SAD diet, in every sense of the word, they're partially clogged. And on a high animal protein, uh, high uh, carb diet, excuse me, low carb diet, they're severely clogged, even though it wasn't necessarily reflected in the risk factors or the weight changes. They're mediated through what are called non traditional risk factors, things that most people haven't heard of, like endothelial progenitor cells and other factors like that. So it's important when looking and asking these questions, first, to actually look at the bottom line, not the intermediary biomarkers, but the actual disease process itself. We've shown using quantitative arteriography, cardiac PET scans, radionuclide ventriculography, thallium scans, cardiac events, that people get better. And to the degree they make these changes, there's a corresponding improvement. 
So I would hate for people to come away from this session thinking like, oh, these damn doctors, they can't make up their minds to hell with them, just you know, bring out the bacon and eggs and don't worry about it. When in fact, while there's always more research to do, and the microbiome, as David <laughs> mentioned, is particularly interesting to me because of how dynamic these changes can be measured. We know quite a lot already. So I, I think um, I can't agree more with what was said, but I do want to point out that I think the complexity of the issues should not take us away from what we already know and the importance Agreed. of nutrition in terms of prevention. And I want to give a couple of examples, and I think both the interaction of diet with our genes as well as with the microbiome is very important and something that... Can we that stop for a second? Because I should have asked David to do this at the beginning. <laughs> Tell the audience what the microbiome is. So microbiome is are bacteria that live in your guts and elsewhere in your body that um, we now understand that it's by itself another um, organ of our body. We live in homeostasis with them. And if that homeostasis, uh, homeostasis is disturbed, then a lot of time it has been demonstrated to be associated with pathological conditions. And as David said, we have probably 100 times more bacteria in our guts than you know, cells in our bodies. So it's a very important component. Of, and it's not just uh, in humans. Microbiomes are in soil. Everywhere. And, yeah. yeah, everywhere. So, and the, the, you know, we are understanding more and more how important they are in terms of our metabolism, in terms of our health, and as well as how they interact with nutrition. So Thank I you. think I can give you an example. For example, I know vitamin E was, was mentioned. And it's probably the most controversial nutrient in terms of um, it's good, it's bad. And, and um, I think understanding how it interacts, for example, with our genetic background can tell us why we see all this controversy. We've done, uh, uh, we did a study a few years back where uh, we were giving vitamin E about 200 IU per day to a group of older people. It was a large study. And we were interested to see if it has an anti-inflammatory effect. And in animal studies, we had observed that there was an anti-inflammatory effect. But in humans, we did not see that. And we were looking at some of the cytokines that are, cytokines are proteins that are known to cause inflammation in body. And so when we looked at uh, this population, we did not see an effect of vitamin E. But when we looked at the genetic background of the subjects, we noticed that in certain subjects with a particular genetic background, um, and those were the people who were producing more of these inflammatory cytokines, vitamin E could reduce the level of the inflammatory cytokines. But in others, it did not. And I think often we go into studies very simplistically. We don't characterize the population that we are looking at. We don't know what their genetic backgrounds are. We now, I mean, we don't know what their microbiota is like. Often we don't even know what the nutritional status of them are and whether we need to improve it or you know, change it in any way. So I, I, I agree with, with um, Dean that we shouldn't, the complexity and the controversy should not uh, keep us away from asking the questions and realizing the importance that nutrition plays in terms of prevention of many of the age-associated diseases, at least in this case. And now we know that early nutrition is also very, very important in terms of your lifelong diseases. Yes. We know that what your mother and even now your father ate has a significant impact on how you grow up and your risk of diseases, and there's a lot of evidence for that. So. Um, we did a study, for example, uh, where we looked at the impact of obesity during pregnancy on um, the newborn's uh, nutritional status. And what we found was that the infants who were born to mothers who were overweight and obese had lower iron status compared to control mothers. And as you know, iron is very important for cognitive function and for many things. So I think it's important to know that there are many factors that contribute as to how nutrition will impact your health. And we need to be aware of that. And we need to be asking the right questions and not sort of just call it off because it's complex. Can I just ask, build on one thing that she said, or would you rather come back? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to come back if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, just, just because I, I want to uh, tap Joan Roca about this. So Joan, I loved what you said about how uh, chefs are sort of newly higher status and well known, and that you can use this to uh, to good effect to help with nutrition and maybe even to support 
better ecology through that. Um, we've just listened to some of the research about how um, nutrition is complex. Um, there are emergent phenomena in the body. Nonetheless, we can see some positive effects in various areas at different life stages and with different mechanisms. Um, how can scientists help the chefs better to do what you need to do to communicate to the public? And how, you know, how is that working now? How could it be improved? <clears throat> well, they really are helping us. I think it's a process which is well underway, um, but which we need to strengthen. Sometimes uh, at um, these cuisine congresses, there are scientists present who enable us to better understand the physical and chemical processes that take place when you're actually cooking food. And that really makes us understand this whole world of science that's, that's behind this understanding. We are a bit immersed in our world of haute cuisine. We try to, through our work, uh, get people excited to put emotion into our food. Um, but we want to be sure as well that that's not, that it's not just a question of this instant emotional impact, but rather that we have an impact on society as well, that people get excited about it, that they uh, watch us on television, buy our books. Uh, so when we're trying to get people excited, we also need to bear in mind that we need to be responsible, that we need to have a deep understanding of nutrition and the impact of the message that we're getting across. What techniques are we using uh, in preparing food? Um, there are food preparation, culinary um, techniques and approaches that are far more respectful to the food and uh, the health of the individual than others. And to have a kind of scientific underpinning to that is very important for us. Uh, that's what we get from this dialogue. Uh, that's, uh, we are, if you like, very nourished by this dialogue. We need to uh, make sure that we avoid um, excessively high temperature, excessively high fat content, um, excessively high burning. Uh, we know all these principles, but as I said, it's good to have a scientific underpinning to things like avoiding salt, sugar, red meat in, in excess. And if you like to have a, a hierarchy of uh, nutrition, which is something that is taught in uh, schools, but it's really a, a side issue. And I, I talk about having learned as a, trained as a chef, uh, having been a father and a son as well. And in light of all of those roles I play in life, I, th I think it's important that in uh, schools where chefs are trained, but not only in schools where chefs are trained, in, in, in schools as well, if young people uh, are taught to appreciate food, to, to know how to prepare it responsibly, to know where the food comes from, knowing, for example, if it comes local, locally, if it's grown locally, it will be fresher, all of those questions. But it's also important that young people, as they grow up, really uh, understand food and cooking and how it impacts on society as a whole. And do you have, do you have any advice for these scientists to, um, to help them to foster what you're doing as well in particular? I mean, I, I was interested to hear that they come to your cuisine congresses. Um, are there other things that they could be doing? In, in well, in Catalonia, we have a foundation, the Alicia Foundation. Um, Alicia in Spanish is short for food and science. And now that foundation promotes dialogue um, and it tries to build and maintain direct contact between people from the world of science and uh, 
people from the world of um, cuisine, chefs. We are constantly asking questions. We're looking for these answers which come up from our work. Um, as we get involved in a creative process, questions arise. We're thinking of um, uh, introducing new techniques. And then we would like to turn to scientists and say, would this be a, a beneficial process or would it be damaging to health? And sometimes the answer is yes, it, it might be damaging and you need to take that into account, obviously. Uh, chefs have an empirical training um, by dint of their vocation, and they really need to, like I say, have a scientific underpinning to their understanding of what they're doing. And when they then are explained to the public what they're doing, they can use that scientific knowledge to do it more responsibly. Thank you. So I think you, you give me a good segue. I wanted to ask um, everybody about different culinary systems and, and effects that they have. Um, you mentioning trying things and then asking, will it work well or not? And then I, after this, I'd like to take some audience questions. But could we speak to that a bit? Yeah, please go ahead. Sure. I, I've actually, I, I think what chefs uh, do particularly is very important in terms of older population because there are changes in their taste and in their smell. Mm. And it's very important to produce food that is um, um, appealing as well as, as healthy. And, and so I think working scientists working very closely with uh, chefs is very important in terms of encouraging both um, healthy cooking and preparation of food. I, I mean, Spain, of course, is different than US, but in US people don't spend the time to cook as much. And so one of the things that we've been doing at our center is to bring chefs and scientists together and have sessions that will talk about uh, healthy foods. And you know, we choose, for example, something, say pumpkin, mm -hmm. and we talk about the health benefits of that. And then we have a chef that works and, and prepares healthy food with that. And, and it's, you know, it's uh, very popular for people because they see that it's not so difficult to prepare food that has health benefits. And I think we need to have more of those collaborations. Other thoughts? I think it's great. <laughs> so I think, I think we've, uh, just, to, just to briefly summarize, I think we've heard about emergent processes. I think we've heard about, I, I'm going to say finding uh, a- Can I criticize one thing, though? Um, Go ahead. Go ahead. What, what, I love what you're doing. But what I would love even more is for you to explain on your menu why you're doing what you're doing. You have this remarkable opportunity for every person who has the privilege of sitting at your table to learn. Why can't we take it a step further? <laughs> la, es, sorry. <laughs> la, la pregunta es... Is your question, why am I doing what I'm doing in my, in my position as chef? Can you explain it more on your menu? Right? So you, you've learned why all this you've in the this Congress changes. and from scientists, and you don't use a high temp. But why not explain that beneath each item on the menu? Say why you do what you do. So when everybody leaves, they can leave with a level of knowledge about food and nutrition that's greater. Be an evangelizer. <laughs> Well, yes, that would be good. People come to enjoy themselves. People come to escape a little bit uh, for three or four hours. So once they come into the restaurant, our job is to make them happy. Um, it's very important as a principle. Uh, obviously, health is related not only to the body, but to the mind as well. So what we're trying to do is to really uh, communicate on that level, make people happy. Paradoxically, in the restaurant, we don't have the issues we're talking about at the forefront of our minds. What we're really focused on is pleasure is a subtle complexity that uh, might awake a certain nostalgia, uh, lost memories, uh, exotic travel, um, more than a question of uh, the of, of whether the food is uh, scientifically good, what we are trying to communicate is the, is the language of cuisine, which uh, 
is evocative of uh, stories, experience, uh, travel. Obviously, it's very complex, not directly related to what we're doing at the moment now, but that's really our job and directly linked to my restaurant, my position as a chef. But I'm also saying, uh, and that's why I'm here today, that as a chef, I do have a social responsibility. So when we're working in the Alithia Foundation, uh, with the scientists, and when we're talking about um, cuisine, we don't lose sight of that picture. We understand that we are ambassadors for a profession which has its own set of ethics and values, and which is very deeply concerned about the state of the food that people are eating and the state of the planet. Respond to that briefly. Sure. Um, one thing I just want to clarify is that there's this common misconception that there's this false choice between is it good for me or is it going to taste good? You know, that am I going to, you know, as a joke, the old joke, am I going to live longer or is it just going to seem longer if I eat healthy food? <laughs> and um, one of the things that I love about what you're doing is that we found that the best way to make healthy food taste good is to work with great chefs, not necessarily health food chefs or whatever, but great chefs, and then say work within these parameters and then uh, the food can be delicious and nutritious. You don't have to make a false choice. And I also wanted to respond to what, David, to what you said. Um, I totally agree with you that when we go to, you know, these false foods uh, like margarine and uh, artificial sugar and so on, that, that was not a good direction. But at the same time, it's not necessarily true that butter is a good choice either. And um, there's a, um, you know, there's this um, kind of often repeated, almost become a meme lately that, Americans have been told to eat low, low fat, they're fatter than ever, so low fat has failed, so you know, we should do some other things. First of all, the problem is, is that when people began eating lower fat foods, they were often eating higher sugar foods, and so trading one bad thing for another is not a good choice. But also, I went back to the USDA and said, what, what have Americans been doing since 1950? Are we really eating less fat? And it turns out that every decade since 1950, Americans have been eating more fat, more sugar, more calories, and more meat. And to be, to be precise, 67% more uh, fat, even though we've been told to eat less fat, we're actually eating 67% more fat, 39% more sugar, um, 57 pounds more, more meat, and 800 calories uh, more per capita. And yet we're so, living longer every year. Yeah, well, that's another issue. <laughs> but the point is, is that um, it's no surprise why we're gaining weight. It's not because we're eating too little fat. It's we're actually eating more than ever. And so I just want to clarify that. Yeah, energy in versus energy out. I, I, think, um, I think that's a good place to maybe start to take questions from the audience, although I, I would love to come back to David and Simi later about, you know, uh, the, maybe the dangers of feeling too strongly about certain kinds of remedies with but, nutrition. But, but I think there's, there are many you can, other People factors. tend to take things yeah, all yeah. one way or all the other, yeah, yeah, and science yeah. is never like that. Yeah. 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 But to get away from this reductionistic view that yeah. it's all one thing, and it's never one thing, and it's not even just all diet, it's the entire uh, lifestyle choices that you make. Did you want yeah, to I was just going to say that there are many factors that have contributed to us living longer. And, y you know, we are living in a different world. And so I think to say that, you know, the fact that people are eating more fat, it goes against saying that nutrition is important as to how you age. I don't know if you mean, meant no. it that way, but I, I think it's sort of the association does not necessarily follow because there are so many other interventions that, you know, we have antibiotics, we have a lot of other things that are helping, not that antibiotics overuse of them is a good thing, but, <laughs> but you know, there are other things that have, have um, contributed to that, so we have to sort of be looking today and what is going to happen in the next few years in terms of our lifestyle and what we eat, I think. Yeah, I mean, what I think we're, what I'm, what I think we're hearing is, of course, it's complicated. Nobody ex ever expected yeah. human systems to be simple, but there are some things that we have learned and continue to learn. Right. And with that, I'd, I'd love to start to take questions from the audience. Um, please raise your hand. Please identify yourself. Please wait for the microphone. And, and maybe somebody over there can help me with uh, folks who are behind me. So I'm going to go here, then here, then here. So first question here. There's a mic right next to you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Stephen Cross from Aon Financial Services. This nothing to do with financial services. It's a question for Senior Rocca uh, and the panel, indeed. Uh, the concept uh, that you mentioned was about low, not high temperature or excessive burning. Uh, the concept of raw foods, where you're making food that's under 42 degrees centigrade, um, what's the general feeling on where that's going? Is it good, is it healthy, or is it a fad? 
Sí, yo, yo creo que, que una de las... Well, yes, I think de las, uh, that... De hecho, bueno, los científicos pueden corroborar... Maybe the scientists will be able to back me up on this or not, but um, we had understood that excessive uh, burning and barbecues, uh, charring, uh, really isn't healthy. También por una cuestión de... Um, so that if we want to preserve nutrients in the food, then low temperature preparation is very healthy. And the transition from raw to cooked um, has to be made in a way that is as respectful as possible to the characteristics of the food. Um, we need to avoid loss of water, dehydration, and we find that if we do that, uh, then texture is improved, taste is improved. So we're talking about very long cooking times at low temperature. Um, we don't want to lose taste uh, at the same time, so what we're doing is avoiding um, cooking methods that char, that dehydrate excessively. Um, and we believe in that way, and as I say, the scientists can back me up, that uh, that is less harmful to health. Can you? It's so hard to talk as a scientist after this kind of beautiful artistic description of food. <laughs> um, and I love the fact that, you know, he's manipulating my mind with tastes of the past and other things. I, I realize that I'm a kind of a, a puppet when I go to a restaurant now. Yeah. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> but, but certainly the scientific data, if you look by, you know, techniques at the cooking styles, Raw food, you get certain nutrients. When you cook food in these beautiful ways, you get other nutrients. And so, you know, your grandmother was probably the smartest that comes to food when she said moderation. So mm -hmm. some of everything, some raw, some cooked, if you really look at it, you know, the Mediterranean diet, as they call it, is a very powerful thing. There was a question here. Right here in the front row. Thank you. Thank you. No, okay. I am Dr. Han from Korea, and then I am um, um, the CEO of um, National Medical Center. And I'd like to raise the issue that, uh, you know, in uh, Korea, it has been long saying that uh, medicine and uh, food has the same origin. So we deal um, uh, um, food as a medicine as well. So it has been uh, an in Korean traditional medicine, always we are dealing with food as a medicine and at the same time in you know, a drug for treat uh, disease. So I think that we are gonna, it's gonna be a really good idea to collaborate in those kinds of study, East and uh, West um, uh, medicine all together. And then to answer your question, Dr. Agus, that um, you know, we in temple food especially, that uh, we always know what we are, I mean, why we are doing and what we are doing in terms of cooking. So probably you know, from the Western side, and uh, I don't think it has been a long time philosophy or value about it. So I think uh, and in terms of science, research, I'd like to put those kind of ideas and what has done in Asian countries into our Western uh, medical research on that in terms of nutrition and uh, medicine at the same time. So I, to, to ask your question that, you know, what's your thought in terms of those kind of collaboration or research, what has been done already in East, uh, Eastern countries, including Korea? I would say, first of all, we're not good at treating most of the diseases we have, no matter what you hear. The death rate of cancer has not fallen dramatically in 50 years. We're still dying of heart disease, et cetera. So any new idea, any new experience, we want to certainly jump onto. Most of the medicines we have are derived from plants and foods. So most of the chemotherapy drugs they have are derivatives from plants. So I would love you know, to work with scientists anywhere you know, whether it be a custom of you ate this when you had this disease, if you look back, there's probably a reason it survived a thousand years. Most of the customs we have that last a long time, drinking wine, you know, you name it, that's lasted, there's a reason for it. And if we look back, in most of the times it does have a benefit. And so any ideas you have, we would love to either work with you or put you to the right person to work because those collaborations can yield success. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stefan Tanda with uh, It's really uh, a request and maybe a bit of a pushback to you, Dr. Agus. 
The request is let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, vitamins are 100 years old. Uh, they have been very, very well researched. They're called vitamins because they're vital to this body cell function. We cannot live without them. Uh, fully agree that the best way to get them is through our diet, uh, like Dean, a diet like Dean described. The sad fact is that 85% of the population doesn't do it or can't afford it. Uh, when you look at the reason why we have iodine in salt, why we have folate in our flour to reduce neural tube fact defects, why we have vitamin A in our milk, tremendous advances have been made that population doesn't know why they are there. They are there for a reason. We deal a lot here uh, with the World Food Program and the development community to get the same kind of public health benefits that have been researched by the John Hopkins Institute, Tufts, Linus Pauling Institute. Uh, and it is a real shame that now in the West, uh, all that is forgotten. And I think part of the reason I would like to hear your view on that is that the, since the science has been established over the last 100 years, to get new science, you really, really have to make a very narrow study. Somebody who had the second heart, uh, heart attack at 55 takes a multivitamin, see whether it reduces the risk of a second heart attack. And then the study says no. And then the headline is, vitamins don't work. Uh, with that short attention span of the public, we're really doing a disservice to throw out 100 years of progress in public health. I certainly don't mean to throw out progress in public health. I mean, there are clearly examples of pregnant women, um, people in lesser developed countries who don't have fruits and vegetables where they need vitamin A, pregnant women need folate among other nutrients and the pregnancy vitamin makes all the sense in the world. But I'm just saying is that every time we've guessed in humanity, let's take lots of this and correct this, we've been wrong. How many friends of yours have rickets, have scurvy, have you know, true vitamin deficiencies in developed countries? And the answer is almost none. Yet when you give vitamin A and beta carotene to smokers or former smokers, it dramatically increased both lung cancer rate and the death rate. And by the way, death is a bad side effect. <laughs> and when you start to look at these, I, I, again, I would love there to be a benefit. I, you know, all I want is progress and people to live better and longer. So if we can find a, a situation where taking these supplements help, I'd be the first one to jump on board. But most of the time they're not. And when you have this complex system and you take, remember when you look at the vitamins, you're taking a lot of something. When you take a lot of, of vitamin D, for example, you downregulate the sensor, the receptor, and you change the whole signaling molecules. It's not just filling up a gas tank, it's that system. And when you take it in a pill form, which we're really not meant to do. Remember, we have a very exquisite mechanism so we don't get too much vitamin D, for example. It's called tanning. The reason we tan is to block vitamin D absorption. Because too much at once isn't good, yet we take these pills with lots of it. And I'm just saying, let's get some data. You know, 97% of African Americans and 70% of Caucasians in the United States are, quote, low on vitamin D. So first of all, who defined what normal was? And, and so we really got to take a step back and say, with everything we do, is there data that doing it actually helps? Question in the back. Hi, my name is uh, Henrik. I'm heading a food retailer in Denmark, and I think that we have a huge re responsibility towards people's health, to what they consume. And uh, when we're talking about this, it's getting very complex and very complicated. And like you said before, with the clouds, when you look at the clouds, you know wh whether it will rain. And I think that people, when they listen to these kind of con conversations, they get confused and they give up. So my question would be to you, how can we simplify so people know more about what's right and what is wrong. Before you answer that question, would you raise your hand if you're feeling confused right now in the audience? Yeah. yeah. Can I uh, okay, take go a ahead. shot at that? Yeah, go ahead. You know, um, my experience is that people who don't know much about something and people who spend their whole lives doing it can make it simple. And one from ignorance and one just from doing it all the time. And I spent my whole life doing it, and it is really pretty simple. Um, Yes, we do need, I mean, I, I'm continuing to do more research. I spend most of my time doing research until recently. I'm still doing it um, because I believe in the power of research. But the fact that we still need to know more doesn't take away from what we already do know. And it goes something like this, you know, eat well, stress less, love more, um, <laughs> move more, and that's pretty much it. So from the standpoint of eating more, uh, eating well, um, 
you know, like I say, in all of our studies, we use the whole foods plant-based diet that's naturally low in fat, naturally low in refined carbs and, and, and sugars. It's, and when you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, you're not only not getting the things that cause disease, you're getting hundreds of thousands of other substances that are protective. You know, phytochemicals, bioflavonoids, carotenoids, retinols, isoflavones, genesine, lycopene, on and on and on that have anti-cancer, anti-heart disease, anti-aging properties. Not things you take in a pill, but things that are in your food. And so your body has this remarkable capacity to begin healing if we can begin working at this level. And there's a, an emerging field called lifestyle medicine, which is lifestyle as treatment. And that's what I've spent so much of my time doing, presuming that if you can reverse a disease, and certainly you can help prevent it. And with all this interest in personalized medicine, we found that it's essentially the same lifestyle intervention for all of these conditions, whether it was reversing heart disease, diabetes, prostate cancer, you name it. It's almost as though if you give your body the right raw materials, it can extract what it needs in order to, to, to heal. And after 16 years, and I also used to think that if we just did good science, that would change medical practice. And to some degree it did, but it really didn't as much as I thought. So I spent 16 years working with Medicare to cover our program. And now Medicare is covering this program for reversing heart disease that we developed. And we're expanding it to diabetes and, and, and early stage prostate cancer which is great because if you change reimbursement, you change medical practice and medical education. We partnered with a company called Healthways. We're, we're training, we're trying to create a new paradigm of healthcare because at the same time that the same scientific studies are showing that the drugs and surgery don't work nearly as well as we once thought. I mean, the studies have shown the meta-analyses of stents and angioplasties that they don't work in stable patients. They don't prevent heart attacks, they don't prolong life, they don't even reduce angina. And the same is true for bypass surgery except in a very small percentage of people who need it. Getting your blood sugar down with drugs doesn't prevent the horrible complications of diabetes, you know, the well, blindness uh, and, and... We gotta oh, stop wait, wait, here. Wait, wait, this no. is just not correcting. David, diabetes drugs work. No. Heart disease drugs work. Surgery saves lives for heart disease. What are you saying? There was a meta-analysis in the, what was now, what's now called JAM Internal Medicine. What was, let me finish, please. Now, uh, what was then the Archives of Internal Medicine, they reviewed all six, now eight, of the randomized controlled trials of angioplasties and stents in, in stable patients, including the COURAGE study, a $39 million study in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they all showed the same thing, that in stable patients, they don't work. That was the conclusion. I suggest you read the article. Okay. And, I, I, and, and likewise, getting your blood, it's not to say that people with diabetes shouldn't take drugs, Getting your blood sugar down with drugs, the Navigator study, also in the New England Journal of Medicine, two drugs to lower blood sugar, thinking that would reduce the complications of diabetes. It actually didn't. The editorial by David Nathan, who did the diabetes prevention program 10 years earlier, found, also found that lifestyle changes work better than drugs. It's not to say that drugs don't have benefit, I, but listen, lifestyle I'm, changes I'm work better. I'm not going to treat cancer anymore. I'll just go on nutritional therapy and it'll cure all cancer. It's I'm great. not saying that. Don't put words in my mouth. Well, it doesn't prevent prostate cancer. There's no data that it will slow the growth of insulin prostate cancer at all. That's not true. We did a randomized control trial uh, with uh, Peter okay, Kell and Bill Fair. If, if I could make a that. suggestion, um, I think, yeah, I think, I think a thing that, that often happens in science um, is that um, there are there are different studies and different conditions with different people, and we are uh, you know we find different things compelling, and the arc of time is where we find the truth. So I just I want to remind the audience that these are experts who are on the stage. They are talking about things that are uh, you know they have deep knowledge of. If you feel a little confused right now, I don't blame you. Uh, a thing uh, a thing that I always go with is what do we see over time. Because one study might say coffee good, one study might say coffee bad. They're not wrong that they said that, but under those conditions, those were the results. So just remember, we're, going to, we're, we're talking about an arc over time. But, but in that same spirit, Marietta, the, the, the idea that fruits and vegetables are the healthiest way for most people to eat in their natural forms, I think, has stood the test. So let's, let, Dean, let's, let's push on the diet point for a minute. I saw there was another question, another question over here, and I, I promise I'll let you ask that in just a minute. So, um, Please, okay. yeah, go ahead. Add something. I, I think there's now a push toward diet-based um, dietary guidelines. Thank you. I was which, just going to ask that. Yeah, which I think is actually <laughs> a, a very good approach because yeah. that's what we need to do. It's, it's food that we eat and we need to have that. You know, rather than dietary recommendations, or, I mean, we need those, but diet-based diet dietary you know, guidelines are, I think, what we, we need to have and we need to have them globally based on the public health needs of particular areas. So each country needs to have their own sort of diet-based uh, guidelines because that would need to be based on their own needs and might be very different in US and might be in some other countries. 
There are some basics that, you know, everyone follows. I mean, you don't need to be eating too much sh sugar or too much salt or, you know, too much fat. But then there are specifics that are, um, uh, each country needs to determine based on their own public health needs. And could we make a recommendation because it is complex, because the um, studies are evolving over time, we're seeing um, things that are patterns or some things that might be a little confusing. How do we recommend to policy leaders how to get to dietary guidelines that are reasonable and good for their country or their people's particular issues. So well, there was. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Could, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, I, I refer there was a very nice uh, panel that was put together but that, that by WHO that actually looked at that. And there's a nice article that I can't remember the reference to, but be happy to provide to people. But they actually had a very nice way of saying, how do you go about setting? dietary, uh, you know, diet-based or food-based dietary guidelines and what are the different steps that you need to be taking. And I recommend people to, uh, to read that. And they also have very, I thought, sensible and easy to follow suggestions in terms of what are some of the basic things that needs to be, people need to be following and be happy to provide that, that uh, reference to whoever needs it if they contact me later. Could you, yeah, or, or could you tell them how to Google it or something? So I think what they, the basics is not very far from what, what Dean was saying is that, you know, you need to be reducing, you know, simple sugars, um, more complex carbohydrates, whole grains, uh, salt in moderation, you know, reducing that, um, reducing the total amount of saturated fat and total amount of fat in the diet. Drinking a lot of fat, I'm sorry. And red meat as well. And re Yes, yeah, having that, you know, lean meat and, and um, more of the whole grains, more of the foods and vegetables, uh, a lot of water to drink uh, as well. And then also I think something that we always forget when it comes to food is food safety, making sure that the food that you consume is safe and doesn't, is not contaminated. And there are a whole set of other recommendations that they have, but I find it very easy to follow, you know, very... And, and not confusing, and I think it made sense, at least to me. You know, the problem is most of those are just not that data-driven. So there are populations in Africa who only eat blood and milk, mm -hmm. and they live a very long life without much heart disease and much cancer. And so I think we have to be very simple when we, when we give these declaratory statements. Mm -hmm. Eat some three courses of vegetables and three courses of this. It's not most of the time really data-driven. There are a lot of ways to achieve a goal. And many cultures have different ways of doing it, and they're all right in the right context. But that's what I first said. Right? Well, that right. makes a that lot of each sense country to needs to use their blood. own <laughs> public health problem and come up with the dietary guidelines. But right. in general, I mean, those are exceptions, but right. in general, um, there are not many people who just drink blood and you know do that. Well, there are so whole think, populations in yeah, Africa that do I, it. And but I think, yeah, but I think that it's important for each country and for each ethnic background to know what is the problem that they're facing. I mean, there's a good example, for example, and if this is true a few years back, I don't know if it's true. Um, the amount of calcium that Chinese consume is less than what Americans consume, which both of them is less than the recommended level. But Chinese don't have as much osteoporosis problem, right? So maybe there are other things in their diet that is important. Well, so we know, for example, we are not, that, I mean, know. it's not necessary to recommend Chinese to increase their calcium, but it's necessary to do it in the US. Right, there's US. a context. So but but a as context. you know, when you eat a lot of animal protein, your body excretes calcium with yeah, the protein. Exactly. So yeah. drinking milk to raise your calcium may be self-defeating. If right. you're on a plant-based diet, exactly. even though you may have less calcium intake, you have lower osteoporosis because yeah. so you're we excreting have, less. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. be careful. I mean, remember 26,000 women in the Women's Health Study, calcium and vitamin D versus placebo, no effect on bone fracture rate. Taking well, there are that other studies that do not issue. show that, actually. I think that's not really true. Before we, before we go study to study, uh, we have five minutes left. I'd like to let the audience ask one or two other questions, if Thank possible. You. So one back here. Yeah. Uh, can you wait for the microphone? I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm Marcela Escobari. I work at Harvard Center for International Development. Um, you talked about... Um, these techniques about how to cook food. I'm interested in what matters for health and how you grow food. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, I, I grew up in Bolivia and I remember coming here and seeing, in the US, seeing the apples and I was like, these must be plastic. Mm -hmm. And I buy, you know, free range organic eggs and they don't taste like the eggs here or the tomatoes. So I'd love to, to hear what we should learn about that. And does organic taste better? And does organic taste better? Claro. Yes, I mean, that's really important. 
And it's important because, well, I think we all agree, ultimately, it's a question of common sense. You just need, to, well, you need to take a common sense, common sense approach to your diet. People pretty much know within the context of their culture um, what's healthy and, and what's excessive. But your question is, is of fundamental importance. Uh, the way that we grow food needs to be respectful. We need to preserve biodiversity. We need to make sure that we don't lose foods from the world. Uh, it's important also to have a, a varied uh, diet. We shouldn't just uh, restrict ourselves to four kinds of apples. There are many, many different kinds of apples, and we need to appreciate and uh, cultivate that biodiversity. And in Catalonia, we, the chefs, have become aware of the fact that many young people are going back to the land and, and treating it in a respectful, indeed even a loving a, a way, so that they are growing foods which are fundamentally more healthy. That's a very important trend, something that we can contribute to, pay attention to, uh, because Otherwise, we will see the detrimental effects of loss of biodiversity due to uh, single crop growing um, and a kind of mass uh, approach, mass market approach to agriculture. So we need to have a dialogue with scientists, but also with uh, small farmers so that we can ensure that our products are as diverse and authentic as possible. Thank you. I actually think we have just one minute left, so I think I'm going to need to wrap up. Um, what an interesting conversation. I think we talked about how food can um, nourish us and, and please us, how it can maybe prevent disease and uh, support us when we're, uh, when we're uh, suffering from some disease states. It's, and it's a pleasure that touches memory and, and creates many joys and that um, uh, the continuing dialogue and an evidence-based, data-focused approach probably will be uh, the best way forward over time. And I, I want to thank everybody so much for, the, uh, for their time and for the terrific conversation. Thank you. Thank you.